Welcome, rad friends, to a sermon I've been wanting to give for some time now. I really enjoy Fallout 4, and have probably put more hours into that game than any other Fallout title. However, time and again as I play through the game, the weaknesses in the four main factions become more and more glaring to me. Thinking through how I would go about fixing some of these issues that I personally observed and have discussed with others, led me to wonder, what could Fallout 4 have looked like? without the presence of the Brotherhood of Steel. The more I thought about this, the more I became convinced that not only would I have preferred a game where our only options were the Institute, the Railroad, and the Minutemen, but that the inclusion of the Brotherhood of Steel may have been a detriment to the game overall. Even for the die-hard Brotherhood fans among you, hear me out first. I want to present my argument and thoughts in the following fashion. I will give the primary assumption that my argument rests on, which is the basis for this video. I will show why the Brotherhood is the best choice of all the factions to cut from the game, why a Fallout game doesn't need the Brotherhood in it to be a good game, what we would really be missing from Fallout 4 should they be removed entirely, and what I would argue is the best way to handle the Brotherhood in Fallout 4, because spoiler, I don't think they should be missing entirely. Lastly, I want to discuss the shortcomings of the other three factions, how they would be changed without the Brotherhood barging in on their giant balloon, and what realistic changes could be implemented to really make them compelling. So crank up the rads and punch Maxon in the face, because we're going to do the Brotherhood dirty. So the primary assumption that underlies my entire argument, and therefore the overwhelming majority of this video, is as follows. The amount of time, resources, creative energy, and game development effort that was spent on implementing the Brotherhood of Steel in Fallout 4 could have been better spent expanding and shoring up the limitations of the other three factions in Fallout 4, namely the Institute, the Railroad, and the Minutemen. In a perfect world, all the development effort that would have been put into the Brotherhood would translate to strengthening all the weaknesses of the game, making characters that much deeper, plot deficiencies of the Institute, Railroad, and Minutemen, or the Big Three as I'm going to facetiously refer to them, smaller or non-existent. Of course, that is not likely how it would actually happen. All that effort would not translate 100% to more and better content for the Big Three in their stories. But even if a fraction of the energy put into the Brotherhood was invested into the Big Three, it would have improved what shipped in Fallout 4. Therefore, I think this line of argumentation does have standing, and seeing as I haven't seen anyone else propose something like this, I want to make the case here and now. As it stands, not quite 10 years from the release of Fallout 4, wow that's a long time, most people agree that all factions, often with the Brotherhood as an exception, are deficient in some capacity. Common critiques are, the Institute doesn't have a clear purpose. Their methods and operations often seem to clash with what they say, or at least what they say they want. If you want a not so short discussion of those issues, you can check out my video on why Sean is at fault for the Institute sucking. The Railroad hardly seems like a faction that is a legitimate threat to the Institute. They have a complete fixation on freeing synths, when there are so many other issues plaguing the people in the Commonwealth. Like for example the exploitation and violence towards non-synth people. The Minutemen, with the exception of Preston and his incessant requests, aren't as bad as the others, but they are a simplistic noble group that lacks much depth or variety. There are plenty of missed opportunities with the Minutemen as well, like retaking Quincy from the Gunners, who mercilessly killed and enslaved everyone there, or even just taking revenge and wiping out the gunners for the good of the commonwealth. As it stands, the Minutemen fill a generic good guy role that, even though you are their general, seems to operate and do as they please, but are also completely incapable of the most basic tasks like making settlements livable by making beds, digging wells, or planting food. It is also worth considering that if the Brotherhood of Steel was not implemented as a full-fledged faction in-game, could a group like the Gunners have been expanded to be another viable main faction within the game? 
All right, that one might be a stretch, but hey, a rad man can dream. Whether you think this assumption has some validity or is completely unrealistic will likely color how you accept the rest of my arguments. But hear me out. Let me know what you think after hearing everything through. So I will address something that is germane to the point I just brought up, namely that most people find Fallout 4's factions to be either unpolished, underwhelming, or missing a lot of potential. Maybe you disagree and think overall the big three are deep, cohesive, and make perfect sense, and to that I would say, you're definitely in the minority. In what seems like a paradox to the entire point of this video, I think the Brotherhood of Steel is the most cohesive faction of the main four. They are ideologically consistent, their actions match their beliefs and intentions, and they have some interesting quests and set pieces like the introduction of the airship flying over Fort Hagen. However, the Brotherhood of Steel is the only faction in Fallout 4 that is a reoccurring group. Although the Institute and Railroad have been mentioned before in Fallout 3, we have not actually seen them as a faction in-game, and Fallout 4 is the Minutemen's debut appearance. The Brotherhood of Steel have appeared in several games prior to Fallout 4 and have had their identity well established. Even with Fallout 3 changing the Brotherhood from a primarily insular and self-interested group to a more altruistic one, Fallout 4 saw a return to form, with Maxon's Brotherhood more in line with the Brotherhood we saw in the first Fallout, and the outcasts in Fallout 3. The Brotherhood is a known quantity, whereas the Institute, the Railroad, and the Minutemen are new to us. Bethesda has only the game of Fallout 4 and one side quest in Fallout 3 to define these three new factions, to tell us what they believe, why they believe it, and what they do about it. It is harder to come up with a new faction that adheres to a unique philosophy, and to sell these groups as legitimate and internally consistent, than it is to reuse an existing and very well-defined faction that has constantly made an appearance across the series. Seeing as a common critique of Fallout 4's factions are that they feel incomplete, inconsistent, or that they needed a bit more time in the oven, so to speak, I think Bethesda did themselves a disservice dedicating so much time and effort on the Brotherhood, only to fall short of the same level of cohesion with their new homespun factions. I and many others would rather have new, interesting, and compelling groups in Fallout games, even though that is understandably much more difficult than calling in one of the old, reliable, and well-established factions like the Enclave, the NCR, or the Brotherhood. And now, I can already hear some of you saying, Rad King, you have it backwards. Since the Brotherhood of Steel is the most consistent faction, they shouldn't be the ones left out from the game, one of the weaker ones should. While I agree that the Brotherhood of Steel seems to be, hands down, the most coherent of all the factions in Fallout 4, having them be even more prominent by eliminating a whole other faction would just elevate them to a status similar to Fallout 3. There we had just two real options, the Enclave or the Brotherhood, and this wouldn't be that far off from that binary. Just substitute the Enclave, which is a technologically superior foe that is ideologically opposed to the Brotherhood, for the Institute, which is a technologically superior foe that is ideologically opposed to the Brotherhood. I love Fallout 3, and not even I would want a rehash of the factions and plot, all just in a different location. The United States is huge and diverse. There should be many diverse groups with different beliefs, characteristics, and aesthetics, not just the same groups reappearing over and over again under different conditions, and Fallout 4 had that potential. This is a good segue to the next point, which is that you don't need the Brotherhood to occupy a prominent spot in the main storyline, or even really be in the game at all. Two of the fan-favorite games in the whole series either have the Brotherhood as a low-priority, small faction that can sometimes be ignored in lieu for the real powers, like in New Vegas, or as basically non-existent, like in Fallout 2. In Fallout 2, there are some isolated Brotherhood bunkers that are largely closed off to the player for a majority of the game. 
and it isn't until a little later that the player can speak more than a few words to one of the Brotherhood representatives, Matthew, and go into the San Francisco Brotherhood outpost. Their presence is inconsequential and has no bearing on the game other than reminding the player that they are indeed still there, even if they're only watching and gathering information on the new threat to this part of the wasteland, the Enclave. The Brotherhood of Steel in Fallout New Vegas are a fraction of the strength and influence that they once were, having been sent into hidden isolation by defeats dealt by the NCR. The Brotherhood in New Vegas is more prominent than in Fallout 2. There is a Brotherhood companion and many quests that determine what happens to the Brotherhood and even whether or not they're destroyed. However, their role is minor. They don't have an effect on the main plot points. These two games show us that the Brotherhood can be present in a subordinate or almost non-existent role, and the game doesn't suffer. In fact, it could be argued that the games benefit from lowering the prominence and importance of the Brotherhood in-game. They don't have to be in a Fallout game to make it a good game or to make it a Fallout game. A new game would be no less Fallout than any previous title if the Brotherhood of Steel did not feature prominently in it. The Brotherhood is an important part of Fallout, but not its core identity, and previous successful and popular titles have shown us that they can and should sometimes feature less prominently. So if the Institute, the Railroad, and the Minutemen could have received more thorough treatment due to the elimination or minimization of the Brotherhood in Fallout 4, and previous Fallout games have shown us that games not featuring the Brotherhood of Steel as a key faction can be outstanding games with compelling stories, I think it's only natural to ask what would be missing from Fallout 4 and its story if the Brotherhood were to be removed. What are parts of Fallout 4's story, characters, set pieces, quests, and overall experience that would be missing if the Brotherhood were suddenly dropped from the game? I have thought of a handful of things, but I would like you to think about this as well and see if we can come up with the same things. In the meantime, I also want to ask if any of the items you think of could somehow be adapted and incorporated into one of the existing main factions, or if they could only exist under the purview of the Brotherhood. After going through all the characters, quests, and locations, I only came up with a handful of answers. Paladin Dance, his story, his personal quest of finding out that he is a synth, and the other quests associated with him are a positive contribution to the game and would be missed if they were suddenly stripped away. I don't see a way for Dance and all his associated backstory and quests to be changed to fit into any other faction and still maintain their impact. The revelation that he is a synth is so hard hitting and memorable because he and the Brotherhood as a whole embody the antithesis of the Institute. They despise synths, they abhor the beings and the technology, and they avidly oppose the Institute, who are the bearers of this tech. There isn't another way for Dance to be reworked into another faction and have the same emotional impact as he does being a part of the Brotherhood. Liberty Prime's presence and use as a weapon against the Institute is another thing that wouldn't make any sense under any other context other than the Brotherhood of Steel. Having him rebuilt and used as a secret weapon to penetrate the Institute could only actually make sense with the Brotherhood of Steel. That said, how key is Liberty Prime to the overall Fallout 4 experience? Sure, there is a cool set piece at the end of the game should the player choose to help the Brotherhood attack the Institute, where the sole survivor and a group of Brotherhood soldiers escort Liberty Prime as he hacks and whacks his way through synths and other wasteland threats, until he burrows a hole through the freaking ground straight to the Institute. The thing is, as cool as that is, it has been done before in Fallout 3. It is essentially a rehearsal of the final part of Fallout 3's main quest, where a team of Brotherhood soldiers escort Liberty Prime to Project Purity as he blasts his way through the Enclave, paving the way for the Lone Wanderer and his Brotherhood compatriots to infiltrate the Jefferson Memorial and wrest control of it from the Enclave. I would argue that it doesn't add that much to the Fallout 4 experience, and certainly doesn't bring anything new to us fans. 
although it was pretty sweet when he grabbed a behemoth by the head and killed it. The Pridwin, which is the airship that is the pride and joy of the Brotherhood of Steel, is an impressive sight and has a really cool entrance into the game after the sole survivor kills Kellogg and emerges from Fort Hagen. Serving as the base for the Brotherhood, it is a unique addition to the Fallout series. And I know, I know, airships were already a thing in Fallout Tactics, but we never actually get to see them flying and operable in-game. The Pridwin definitely sets Fallout for a part and makes the Brotherhood's use of vertebrates that much more important since that is the primary way that the Brotherhood members get to and from the airship. I don't think any other faction in Fallout 4 could or would create such an airship except for the Brotherhood and it was a cool nod to Fallout Tactics as well. Again though, how important is its inclusion to Fallout 4 as a whole? Probably a bit more than Liberty Prime since it is a new and interesting element that we haven't seen before. But overall, not that impactful. Fallout 4 could have a compelling story and memorable set pieces without ever seeing the Pridwin. I think it is also interesting that in the Art of Fallout 4 book, there is a note near some concept art of a giant robot and an airship. It notes that this concept art of a giant military robot and an airship served as the inspiration to include Liberty Prime and the Pridwin into the game. And to me, that makes it seem like it wasn't a core part of the Brotherhood or their portrayal from the get-go. The last two things that seem to set the Brotherhood apart in my mind could be rolled into some other faction. Power armor is used almost exclusively by the Brotherhood, but there is no reason why it couldn't be used by anyone else. Hell, even the Institute had some power armor concept art, having a Minutemen heavy gunner division, specialized railroad shock troops, or even the gunner who themselves are organized and function militaristically would be a perfectly acceptable substitute. Vertebrates are almost the exclusive domain of the Brotherhood, but they don't have to be. The Gunners can be found flying a vertebrate in Fallout 4, and there's no reason why the Minutemen couldn't learn to use them as part of an Air Corps, or the Railroad could opt for vertebrates to quickly move assets around, especially at night. Nothing about vertebrates inherently makes them the sole domain of the Brotherhood, and so we could absolutely still have encounters with vertebrates and the vertebrate transportation system without them. Those are the only tangible things that I could come up with that would immediately feel like they were missing, that the Brotherhood just suddenly vanished from Fallout 4. Some of them could be easily associated with other factions. Others serve as set pieces within the game that may or may not have any real importance or relevance to you. And the last one, Dance and his quests, would be a legitimate loss to the Fallout 4 experience. Oh, and Maxon's bomb-ass coat, that would be missed too. There are a number of other things of decreasing importance, like I think Proctor Ingram is a great character, and it's cool to see her get around in a modified power armor chassis, as well as the chance to convince Madison Lee to defect from the Institute and rejoin the Brotherhood. But these really aren't that necessary. Now there is an intangible aspect of the Brotherhood that I believe is important and would be missing if the Brotherhood vanished from the game. Their attitude towards the Institute is unique among the different factions and to be frank, all the factions have their own unique perspectives pertaining to synths and the Institute. The Institute believes that what they are doing is important and justified, thinking the synths are only machines. The Railroad believes synths are people, that the Institute is evil insofar as they treat synths like slaves rather than people, and the Minutemen only dislike the Institute because they attack settlements, eventually attack the Minutemen directly, and otherwise destabilize any attempt for the Commonwealth to unify. The Brotherhood takes their dislike of the Institute to the highest level of all. They hate Generation 3 synths on principle. They think that it is technology run amok and only deserves to be destroyed. They hate the Institute because not only are they the originators of the synth technology, but they show no remorse in using and advancing technology beyond the bounds that the Brotherhood thinks is proper and safe. They view synth technology as dangerous, and the creation of synthetic sentience as reckless, and unregulated use of synth tech to be just as lethal as the pre-war nuclear arsenals that cloaked the Earth in flame. That makes their opposition to the Institute all-encompassing, from the members of the Institute to their goals, to the means by which they accomplish those goals, aka the use of synths. So without the Brotherhood, there would be a vacuum, there would be no group 
that wholeheartedly opposes the Institute on every level. Both the Minutemen and the Railroad are sympathetic towards the plight of synths to varying degrees, while opposing the Institute itself because of their actions and the violence that the Institute meets out. I think having a faction that is the polar opposite of the Institute is important to have because it gives the player the option to align with a group that also thinks the Institute is morally evil and the synth technology an abomination. So if the Brotherhood are not in Fallout 4 anymore, who would a player who is in staunch opposition to the Institute and synth technology join? I think this is a legitimate concern, but is also an example of what I am trying to say. What if, in the absence of a Brotherhood whose sole mission is to oppose the Institute and synth technology, the player was given the opportunity to steer the Minutemen in that direction? One of the several complaints that is often aired against the Minutemen is that the sole survivor, being given the title of General, which is the highest ranking office, at least at this point in the Minutemen's history, we have pathetically little effect on the organization. We are told where to go in order to defend settlers, neutralize threats, and clear enemies from settlements. And that's about it. Our influence on the organization is rather shallow, and we never really fulfill the role of a leader. But what if we had the choice to either steer the Minutemen towards a more militant disposition, or let them continue to be a glorified defense pact amongst settlements? I want to run a scenario by you to show you how we could simultaneously have our enemy of the Institute and a more interesting and dynamic Minutemen faction that would change based on the player's choices. Preston Garvey is the universally beloved quest giver and subordinate to the sole survivor within the Minutemen command structure. But what if, after gathering a bit of strength by allying a few settlements, a former member of the Minutemen came back into the fold? This previously high-ranking member would have a different stance than Preston Garvey, agreeing that the Institute needed to be opposed because they were a security threat, but then taking it further, believing that synths are a menace and the technology presents a unique danger. Both Garvey and Anti-Garvey, as I will call them, would have the player's ear, giving their best arguments for their positions. Ultimately, the choice is left to the player regarding who they agree with and who they choose to have as second in command. This would have an effect on what fellow Minutemen say, how they regard the Institute and Synths, and just the faction as a whole. This would accomplish everything that we had spoken of. We could have a faction that is entirely opposed to the Institute, like the Brotherhood. The Soul Survivor would be making actual leadership choices that changes how the Minutemen operate and what they believe. And lastly, it would make the Minutemen much less shallow. They would show a diversity of thought and ability to be transformed, but not completely changed. They aren't turning into an entirely different faction. They are just going from supportive or apathetic towards synths to regarding them with suspicion, discriminating against them, and possibly reacting with violence. Would you be willing to give up the presence of the Brotherhood as a main faction in Fallout 4 for a scenario similar to what I just described? If Bethesda let the existing factions cook just a little longer, largely due to the extra time and creative effort that would be unlocked from not adding the Brotherhood into the game, we could realistically expect such improvements to the Big Three. Despite what I have said previously and the title of this video, I don't think completely stripping everything related to the Brotherhood of Steel would be the best thing for the game. I think having a presence somewhere between Fallout 2 and Fallout New Vegas would be the sweet spot because there are some unique things that the Brotherhood brings to the table. Before the Brotherhood of Steel arrives in the Pridwin, there is a small but notable Brotherhood contingent that are already in the Commonwealth. Paladin Dance and surviving members of his group, Halen and Reese, are part of a recon group called Recon Squad Gladius, whose mission was twofold. To find out what happened to an earlier recon group that lost all communication shortly after getting to the Commonwealth, and to look for technology as well as any information on the Institute. With just Dance and the remnants of Squad Gladius, we get a lot of great content. Aside from the introductory missions that involve helping defend the squad from a ghoul attack, and the subsequent mission to help Dance recover the deep range transmitter, as well as building a good relationship with Dance, there is quite a bit more. The mission, called The Lost Patrol, has Dance ask the sole survivor to help in sleuthing out what happened to Recon Group Artemis, the group that came before Dance's group that had gone dark. 
This leads the player to find the remains of the members of that group, recover holotapes, and learn about their experience and their fates along the way. It ultimately ends in the player heading to Recon Bunker Theta, where the lone remaining member of the Recon Group Artemis has taken refuge for years, trying to establish contact with the rest of the Brotherhood and carry out the objectives he and his group set out to accomplish. Being isolated so long though has caused him great psychological distress, and he harbors guilt over being the only remaining survivor. This is a pretty good mission, and it is a nice surprise to find a surviving member of the team, and it is humanizing to speak to Paladin Brandis and learn of his hardships and trauma. There is even a great option to ask him to rejoin the Brotherhood, but it requires three increasingly difficult speech checks. Dance and his group have executed several recon missions, one against the Raiders at the Corvega plant in Lexington, where they lost two members of their team, and at least one other one where they scouted the ruins of the Boston airport, and Fort Strong, where they ran into a large group of super mutants. All of this is enough to make Dance and his small brotherhood group compelling in their own right, offering interesting quests that expand the lore of the brotherhood and their interest in the commonwealth. Dance could still be available as a potential companion, so the player would not lose the chance to team up with the only available companion that is from the Brotherhood. What if Paladin Brandis, the survivor in Bunker Theta, could be convinced to join with Dance and his group, both helping him to work through his trauma with a new Brotherhood family, while also bolstering Dance's beleaguered group? In this hypothetical, the only compelling plot point that would be missing is having Dance find out that he's a synth and the subsequent choices and consequences of the varied outcomes. Usually, this quest, called Blind Betrayal, starts after the sole survivor returns from the Institute, having scanned the Institute network and uncovering data that outs Dance as a synth. However, the main Brotherhood force wouldn't need to necessarily even be there for that whole subplot to still take place. The Railroad and the Minutemen also give you a scanner because they are interested in whatever information they can copy from the Institute network. It would be an easy enough situation where the Minutemen or the Railroad pull the player aside to tell them that their current or former companion, Paladin Dance, is suspected to be a synth, and it would be up to the player to confront Dance with that information and deal with the aftermath. Even if the player doesn't or hasn't had Dance as a companion, they could relate to the sole survivor that they have intel on an Institute synth, and the whole thing could be kicked off from that point. I haven't even mentioned the existing Radiant quests that Reese and Halen give the player, but what would keep Dance from asking the player to help fully scout out points of interest that they had previously visited, or tried to visit before they were attacked and beaten back? This would offer more quests for those that want to exhaust all the Brotherhood content. I think this is more than enough and starts becoming a quality versus quantity issue at a certain point. In my proposed version, there would be the Lost Patrol quest, Dance and his associated quests, and ultimately the Blind Betrayal subplot where he is discovered as a synth, which all together rank as some of the most compelling Brotherhood quests in Fallout 4. It could all easily be fit into a Brotherhood that consists of Dance and the remainder of his group, as well as the lone survivor from Recon Group Artemis. You really don't need anything more than that. And so the Brotherhood in this scenario would distill most of the best elements of the vanilla Brotherhood in Fallout 4 and make them more akin to the Brotherhood that we encounter in Fallout New Vegas, although even smaller in scale. If we are speaking in hypotheticals though, there's no reason why a DLC couldn't have been made that brought a larger Brotherhood force to the Commonwealth with its own unique story and quests. And in case some of you forgot and are now saying, that sounds like what we got in Fallout 4, just with extra steps. Remember, the premise of this whole argument, which was the time put into creating the Brotherhood of Steel, all the assets, characters, quests, etc., could improve the Big Three if it was reinvested into making them more robust factions. I don't consider DLCs as eating into the creative budget of the base game, so having a Brotherhood of Steel-centered DLC could be fine under these circumstances. So with the bulk of the Brotherhood out of the picture, what could that mean for the remaining factions? What could these improvements that I keep arguing would be possible even look like? 
I already went through a scenario that gave the Minuteman more depth and would have provided the player with choices relating to how the faction would evolve over time, which is proof that we don't have to ask for the moon or completely reimagine any of these factions. The Institute is seen by many as having a nebulous and confusing goal. How do Gen 3 synths lead to redefining mankind? How does replacing people on the surface fit in with their claim that they will not interfere with the unimportant details of surface dwellers' personal lives, so long as they do not interfere with the Institute's work? Why do they seem so perplexed that the surface hates them when they do things like wipe out entire settlements for the sin of having some old pre-war research that they are interested in? Why can they make perfect human replicas, an advanced nuclear reactor, and teleportation, and yet still make a laser that is worse than any pre-war laser rifle? Why were they so invested into FEV research? For no apparent reason, a reason not even known to the scientists conducting the research, only to dump the resulting super mutants on the surface where they kill and pillage hapless settlements. With no coherent philosophy, it is hard for anyone to sit down and agree to join the Institute. Their methods seem extreme, their ideology inconsistent, and their goals opaque. You can't help but feel that maybe after one more quest, someone in the Institute will start to fill in the blanks and connect the dots, but it never actually comes. The time spent developing the Brotherhood of Steel could be spent addressing these issues. Create a coherent institute worldview to justify the existence of Gen 3 synths by, for example, saying that Gen 3 synths are finally the perfect tool to release man from menial labor, allowing mankind to dedicate their time and effort to the advancement of the sciences and arts. Some sort of technocratic paradise that would at least give people the option to explore such an idea, and they would side with the Institute based on whether or not they agree with such a future. Explain the rampant synth replacements and destroying of settlements as a lack of centralized leadership, and the result of giving too much freedom to Conrad Kellogg, who led the attack on University Point, and the various department heads who are using synth infiltration for whatever they like. For example, Bioscience replaced Roger Warwick with a synth so that they could plant some modified seeds and see how they grow. And afterwards, they would dispose of all evidence, implying the destruction of the homestead and the murder of everyone there. Make it a decision for the player once they become the head of the Institute, and they can decide to maintain this sort of divided leadership model because it trades this chaos for ruthless efficiency or the player could opt to divest the others of power and all those decisions would be centralized in one or two individuals, making the division heads a bit unhappy, but now there's accountability. Make the Institute seem a little less sterile by adding an off-kilter scientist who is shunned and put in a part of the Institute that is mostly old CIT facilities, who will lament that the focus on synths has led to inferior technology in other areas that the Institute refuses to acknowledge, like their lasers. Helping him by bringing him laser weapons from the surface could allow him to modify an Institute laser rifle that actually is superior to pre-war tech. This would allow some acknowledgement of inferior Institute technology, there would be a reason for it, and a workaround to get a unique Institute laser weapon. Explain the FEV research and associated secrecy as being a project to try and engineer gene therapy for Sean as a last ditch effort to cure his cancer. He was already keeping his condition and prognosis a secret, and this would provide a reason for the research scientists to be kept in the dark and for the strange continual push by leadership to do the research until it was forcefully ended by Virgil. Add more dialogue between Sean and the sole survivor that humanizes Sean to a greater degree. Maybe Sean admits to being bad at relationships and doesn't understand family because of his rigid academic upbringing. And let us see his inexperience in this realm by showing vulnerability and opening up to the sole survivor about it. We could go on and on, but none of these changes would require rebuilding the faction from the ground up, but would lead to the Institute making more sense, being more cohesive and more relatable. They would give the player a way to be a leader and make actual changes, and overall, just make them a more attractive option to side with. 
The railroad is considered underwhelming by many people, but for reasons that are different from the Institute. Why do they seem so weak and ineffectual even though they are the primary opposition to the Institute? They don't seem like a main faction, since they don't have any considerations beyond saving since. Why, even though they have a pre-war, forecasting supercomputer, does that not seem to make much of a difference in their fight with the Institute? Why do they seem far less concerned about the slavery or generalized atrocities against non-synth people? Why is the secret code to get into their base just their name? The railroad is so focused on freeing synths that they are missing the forest for the trees. They need to have a more expansive paradigm than just believing that synths are worth saving. What is keeping someone from siding with the railroad over the Minutemen, who themselves don't seem to have any malice towards synths, but also have more far-reaching goals like destroying groups that threaten the Commonwealth? While they have the facade of a cloak and dagger group that is highly focused on subterfuge, intelligence gathering, and surgical operations, these things are not experienced by the player nearly as much as they should be. By letting the railroad game design cook for a little longer, we could have had a faction that could present a far more compelling plan for the Commonwealth than just save the synths. If the railroad expressed a belief in a united Commonwealth government, similar to the failed Commonwealth provisional government, they could use their agents, contacts, and networks to force the cooperation of the three main settlements, Diamond City, Good Neighbor, and Bunker Hill, at the end of the game. Believing themselves to not be in a position to govern the Commonwealth, opting to stay out of the limelight, they instead carry on their mission of fighting oppressors, whether they be raiders, super mutants, or gunners. In effect, they provide fertile ground for a new government by providing security, exploiting the leverage they have developed to ensure cooperation, and using their clout as the ones that took down the Institute. This would be distinct from the Minutemen, since it would put an emphasis on the big settlements and less of an emphasis on the smaller communities that band together in mutual defense and therefore the player could decide what they think is a better option for the Commonwealth. The railroad could have been more prepared to respond to criticisms, like the accusation that they only care about slavery if it's a synth. They could state that they first got their start by fighting slavery in the Commonwealth before Gen 3 synths even existed. They were so good at what they did, they wiped all large-scale slaving operations off the map. And that is why they focus on synths right now, and also why there is no real large slaving operations in the Commonwealth. Pam, the predictive analytical machine, showed that she had some real utility in predicting events and mitigating disasters, like one event only known as the Pascal Incident, where her predictions allowed the US to stabilize a potential disaster near Taiwan. As such, being in control of the railroad and having been reprogrammed to support their cause, she is incredibly underutilized. After the raid on the switchboard where she was found, the railroad agents should be incredibly and suspiciously slippery, able to thwart or get away from any institute plans to entrap them. They begin to rebuff coursers trying to sniff out railroad agents and their safe houses due to Pam's predictive capabilities with increasing effectiveness. This should be reflected in the Institute, where they express dismay and cannot understand why their efforts to take out the railroad are at an all-time low despite having dealt a huge blow by sacking the switchboard base. If the player is deciding to side with the Institute, they can reveal that the railroad is using an extremely advanced analytical machine to evade their efforts. The Institute could concoct a plan. The player would continue to cooperate with railroad operations, but they would feed Pam bad data that was manufactured by the Institute. This would lead to Pam giving worse and worse predictions, leading to increased Institute success, a breakdown of railroad leadership, and maybe some suspicion towards the sole survivor. The railroad could be divided into two camps, one who advocates for using Pam for every major decision, and one who thinks leaving all important decisions to a pre-war machine is dangerous and that divide could widen if Pam's predictions start failing more often due to being fed this bad information. While the railroad opposes the Institute, it's primarily due to their enslavement and exploitation of synths and the attacks from the Institute more than a visceral hate for them like the Brotherhood. Therefore, they are the one faction that would potentially be interested in a solution that did not result in the destruction of the Institute. They already have quests where they have an institute contact, codenamed Patriot, 
and they work through him or a synth nicknamed Z1 to foment internal rebellion. But in the main game, this only manifests as either additional help in the battle for the Institute or saving a group of 13 synths. The main quest still ends with the detonation of the Institute nuclear reactor and complete destruction of the facility. If the player doesn't sound the alarm to evacuate the Institute, the Rebels won't even survive the resulting explosion. They really are not all that consequential to the ending, even though there are several quests related to them, and these quests are super cool and unique, quite unlike anything else in the game. An option to wipe the Institute off the map should be available to the player, but so should the possibility to instigate a rebellion and raid the Institute to kill or take prisoner all the scientists and leaders who refuse to grant Synth's freedom. Allow the Institute to be run and become home of the Synths, where they can control their own destiny and the means by which they can reproduce like any self-governing group of humans could. This would make the Institute an endgame settlement and another party in the effort to form a commonwealth government. Successfully pulling off a revolution from inside the Institute seems more in line with the Railroad's MO than just blowing it up. This isn't even getting into how taking synths, wiping their memories, and implanting false ones is its own fascinating moral quandary, and that feeds into the memory den and its underutilization in game. I could go on for a long time, going over all the common criticisms of the factions in Fallout 4 and finding ways to fix every one, or make them at least a little better in a way that wouldn't necessitate going scorched earth and reworking the factions from the ground up. Or, you know, even expanding some smaller factions that had a lot of potential. The Gunners were built up as the enemy of the Minutemen, and given their fighting capability and size, they could have served as a fourth main faction that actively opposes the Minutemen. The Triggermen also come to mind, a group that is quickly forgotten after the initial quest to rescue Nick Valentine, but could have been something far more in depth and consequential. For those that say that no amount of extra time or effort could have led to any improvements, maybe you're right. But if extra development time would not lead to a better end result, then we essentially consign ourselves to believing that any attempt by Bethesda is doomed to fail. And not only do I think that is a fatalist way of thinking, but I disagree with it. Bethesda has shown that they can indeed create compelling stories with internally consistent groups with complex relationships. One of my favorite examples is the Far Harbor DLC, and after its release, it was considered by many to be a very well-made story, with interesting factions, moral dilemmas, and quests. Well, except for the Dima memory quest. Those levels sucked. There is even a really good example of how Bethesda could take a homegrown group, the Children of Adam, and take them from a quirky little cult and give them depth, a stronger identity, and grow them into one of the DLC's main factions. So I am less interested in arguments that say that Bethesda won't or can't, and that instead, given the proper direction and resources, that they would and could make great factions. So I turn to you, dear rad friends, to give me your thoughts. In my perfect scenario, with a scaled down brotherhood, a more fortified big three, and potential inclusion of a fourth faction, or maybe having a brotherhood DLC, would you prefer that over what we got? Do you think it is reasonable that given more time and development, that Bethesda could have achieved something greater? Would removing the Brotherhood mostly or entirely from the game really make Fallout 4 so much worse in your eyes? I have been wanting to have this discussion for a while, and I want to hear what you have to say. Big thanks to my patrons who support me, and I want to shout out my new patrons. Ice Age, <laughs> nice, Soap Cowboy, Julius Kingsley the 13th, and Sophia Patrescu. I'm sure I butchered that. If you start to get a little tingly, don't worry, it's just the gamma rays. If you want to support me, check the links below, or let's chat on my Discord. Walk in Adam's glow, everyone. Please take care of yourselves. We are all needed in Adam's kingdom, and I will see you soon.